Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Cameron and I'll be the moderator of today's webinar. Today we'll be discussing how data drives decision, a webinar on how you can better capitalize on the industrial internet of things and cloud services. To help us get there, UbiDots will be joined by our friend Tony Vera even from the Control System Integrators Association, more commonly known as CSIA. I see some people are still joining, so we'll give them a few more moments here. But in the meantime, we've got a quick one question poll active to help us get to know who we're chatting with a little bit better. The results of this poll will tailor our presentation more to be more or less technical in an attempt to serve you guys and gals a little bit better. After all, data does drive decisions. We'll give it about another 30 seconds here. And with that, we're going to go ahead and close our webinar, or excuse me, close our poll and thank everyone for joining. I'd like to turn things over now to our friend Tony. Tony, take it away. Hi, Cameron. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you just fine. Great. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the CSIA Partner Technical Webinar Series. My name is Tony Verovin, and I am the CSIA Membership and Marketing Manager. I'm happy to introduce our partner and webinar hosts from Ubidots. CSIA is pleased to co-sponsor this educational webinar with our partner members and valued industry proponents. And stay on this slide, please. For those of you who are unfamiliar with CSIA, we're the only trade association focused on advancing the system integration industry. Our vision is to ensure that manufacturing and process industries everywhere have access to low risk, safe and successful application of automation technology. To accomplish this, CSIA supports system integrator companies in becoming better businesses. We offer guidance to improve integrator effectiveness with our best practices and benchmarks manual, an open forum to network and learn from other companies and opportunities to market within the industry. As our members continue to improve their management skills, they can begin to work toward becoming CSIA certified, an industry standard in SI business excellence. Next slide. CSIA membership offers members access to resources needed to attain its business goals. These benefits include networking opportunities at the annual executive conference, marketing toolkits, educational materials, and the Industrial Automation Exchange, an online buyer's guide and community that connects end user clients with system integrators and industry suppliers. Clients in all industries are now seeking integrators with CSIA certification alongside of, sometimes instead of ISO. They recognized they recognize CSIA certified integrators commitment to industry standards and business acumen. As a result, being certified can shorten the sales cycle. It also means a supplier's technology is well represented and greatly reduces the risk of project failure. Certified system integrators generally run better businesses. The Industrial Automation Exchange is the premier automation guide featuring system integrators and suppliers who provide industrial manufacturing and process automation solutions. For integrators and suppliers, it's a, it's a place to market their expertise. Clients will find white papers, case studies, capabilities, contact information, and engage in conversation directly with CSIA members. We just launched the Talking Industrial Automation Podcast, where you get to know the people that make modern manufacturing and processing possible. Visit TalkingIndustrialAutomation.com to listen and subscribe. If you have not done so already, I encourage you to register for the 2018 CSIA Executive Conference, April 24th through the 27th in San Francisco. I know that uh, our friends uh, at Ubidots will be there, and uh, you can meet them there as well. So look forward to seeing you guys. Visit controlsys.org for more information. Augustine Pelez 
of Ubidots is our presenter today. Thanks for hosting this webinar. Take it away, Augustine. Awesome. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, Cameron, for introducing us as well. Um, we, I'm, my name is Agustin, and just want to quickly start my video here so we have a more direct conversation. Um, should be starting right now. There you go. So, yeah, cool. So, uh, my name is Agustin, I'm the CEO of RubyDots, and today I'm here to, to share our perspectives on data aggregation analytics, uh, what we have learned on the way, and how you and your clients can extract value from the industrial IoT and the cloud. And at UbiDots, there, well, we do one thing. So that's our mission. We help companies understand the data that's being generated by thousands of sensors all around us. And data, as you know, is the new oil, is the new value in value proposition. And it is the goal of this webinar to help, to help you create and provide the products and services to help you create those uh, data-driven solutions. So we'll be splitting this in three three ways. Uh, so the first part will be covering uh, why are we talking about this now at all? Like what, what are those technology enablers that are uh, enabling this data-driven paradigm? Uh, the second part will be talking about the benefits of engaging in this new world. And last, we, lastly, we'll have a live demo. So we'll be using uh, an IoT device made by Siemens. It's called a, a Simatic IoT 2040. And we'll be using it to create a simple HVAC monitoring application. And uh, with that, let's begin. So why are we all here? So we, we've had a great turnover. Thank, thank you all for attending. Uh, I, I guess we all have one thing in common, and that is we all believe that data-driven applications can catapult our businesses and our end customers' businesses. So at UbiDots, we like to refer to this outlook as the blue ocean of IoT. And from its definition, a blue ocean is a market that has little competition and little price and pressures. Uh, as an example, UbiDots itself exists as, because of this theory. And that only proves that the IoT in general has the characteristics of, of a blue ocean market. And that is, uh, it helps create new businesses entirely from scratch or create new businesses on top of already successful businesses. Now, how, how do we see that happening? So, two things. The first is uh, at the new services. So, in one hand, uh, this blue ocean allows integrators to create adjacent services to existing customers. So, this, this is possible by using the infrastructure that you already have in place. That's the best part. For example, let's think about an uh, integrator offering production live monitoring services. Uh, that's availability or performance of production line and using the same tools and the same capacity of the company this integrator is being is now being able to offer energy monitoring services so the second part is the digitization of support so the the by enabling machines to report potential failures not only to the operator of the machine but also for the team responsible or fixing that machine uh, who might be even outside the factory will allow you as an integrator to become relevant not only as a supplier but more like a partner in your end customer's production process now let's change gears a little bit from these conceptual approaches to a more practical approach and let's look at the technology drivers that are enable enabling this new paradigm so we we see these two worlds as you can see in this slide uh, we've been uh, looking at this for, for many years. Uh, two worlds of technology development completely separated. In one side, we have uh, hobbyists, uh, DIY users, uh, communities that have been uh, playing with, with low-cost components to prototype uh, one-off projects, mostly for fun or for education. And the other side of the spectrum is where you and your clients are most familiar with, uh, this is the world of industrial PLCs, gateways, uh, industrial grade uh, protocols such as MatBus, OPC, UA. And this is the these are the technologies that are running most of today's uh, factories. 
So they are designed to be durable. Um, and in exchange of that, the reliability, also a higher cost to set up and, and a higher cost overall is also expected. Now, over the past few years at UbiDots, we have been working with the SIs and OEMs and that are targeting or playing in this great area between these two worlds. Uh, and it's basically all about getting the best out of the two worlds. So this new area exists thanks to, in one side, falling hardware prices of industrial components, and on the other side, improved processing capabilities of uh, and, and ease of use of the DIY world, uh, which together uh, just become uh, uh, durable and at the same time easy to use at the point that they can be programmed by uh, people in your IT staff, uh, be it an automation client or a system integrator, uh, allowing to for new applications. So that's what we'll be looking at today. Uh, let's see how that looks like in the hardware world to start with. So in the left side here, we have a DIY computer. It's called the Raspberry Pi. Uh, most of you might already know it's $35 computer, the size of a credit card. And it's what it was made famous by the DIY community, but some industrial IoT customers are already reporting the use of these Raspberry Pis and other types of single board computers for non-critical applications. So they are used in the shop store, just not for critical applications. For example, they might use it to attach it to a screen to loop informational videos about the company, or if they hit a milestone, a milestone in the production process, then the boom, something comes up in the screen, or they other find it like a perfect way to execute a quick POC with low cost components and then scale that up from their, those findings. In the other side of the spectrum, we have the industrial PLCs. This is where, where most of you might already be accustomed to. And of course, they are a safe bet for critical processes. But in a lot, of, a lot of cases, buying a 5K PLC for a non-critical process just feels like using a lion to kill an ant. It's just too much power. In fact, some experts have pointed out that the, the computer power that you get inside a PLC is actually worth around $200. So you really are paying a premium for the durability, the support, the traditional distribution channels, and the brand, of course, but is that premium really necessary for all of your projects or will that drive a negative ROI? Now, because of that is why we got, now we have these converging worlds in the middle. It's what we're calling today uh, industrial DIY. And it's, it's a, a combination of both uh, single board computers backed by uh, prominent uh, suppliers such as Siemens, uh, the one here below is the one we'll be using today. And the, the stigma of single board computers today just seem to, the, the low cost benefits seem to outweigh that stigma in a lot of applications. Uh, now let's see how that looks like in the software world. So on the left side, we have uh, do-it-yourself uh, approaches. So these are mostly homegrown uh, or work for hire developments, which are single one-off implementations that are often hired by internal IT staffs. And sometimes these just go over budget and even though, or, or under delivering expectations, even though they might seem inexpensive, uh, they could be quickly become a headache at the end. Uh, at the other side of the spectrum, we have the industrial version of, of these softwares. Uh, this is what most of you already know, uh, MES systems, shop floor controls, SCADA systems. And while this is, again, safe bet, just like PLCs, these govern most of today's industrial world. This might not be the, the, the best option for other types of projects where you actually see either the project being killed or not, not being done in general or, or driving a negative ROI because of the high cost and setup complexity of these systems. And because of that, again, we, we have seen this uh, middle ground being born where you got, you got uh, in cloud platforms providing 
very simple ways to aggregate industrial data into one place, offer secure data storage, alerting systems, and more and more tools that are enabled by web technologies in general, just all of this designed to make the lives of IT staff and OT staff easier and more efficient. So these fast to set up projects are offering real time insights of the factories and are allowing integrators and operators to move the performance deal in the right direction, becoming very relevant to their clients and extracting value from the industrial ILT. Now, besides the obvious cost benefits of hardware and software development, uh, what else can we find in this world? So, first thing, as we say, is, is cost saving. Uh, don't buy a PLC that's designed for 800 things if you're just going to use it for one thing. The second is the ongoing upgrades. So, one of the best things about uh, cloud based suppliers is that the, the software, as you, as you know, is always being upgraded. So, best case, uh, best example is. Netflix, so you, you wouldn't expect to buy a Netflix subscription to see the same shows every month, right? And, and just like we as consumers expect that, our companies also should expect that. And by working with cloud-enabled suppliers, uh, your company is exposed to, in, in, the, in the positive sense of it, to all of the innovation that's taking place outside. Uh, this could be a faster database, it could be a new visualization, it could be a new library. In fact, the, the device we'll be using today, I was just uh, Googling this week about the actual libraries that are built in into it, and I found out that not all of them are uh, made by Siemens. So Siemens is the centralizer of all of these tools, uh, but there's one, for example, there's a your OPC UA driver that allows you to connect to OPC devices in, in the factory, and then relay this data to the cloud. And this was developed by uh, some guy in Germany who happened to have 20 years experience in these drivers and thought it was a good contribution to the community to you know, develop this library. So you really get a lot by, by using the cloud and, and getting these upgrades. The third part is the flexibility of the cloud. So instead of waiting for uh, the approval of a 100K or a 200K project that's going to take six to 12 months to close, um, the flexibility of the cloud is allowing integrators to start very lean, working with key areas of the companies to uh, identify specific problems, be it uh, a CO2 monitor or an HVAC monitor like we're doing today, and they'll scale this up to the entire plan. So this can really help you reduce your sales cycles uh, while, of course, growing your business. And basically, our advice here is to look for those quick wins, and instead of you know chasing after those elusive uh, hundred thousands of dollars white wheels that are going to take a lot of time to close. The fourth benefit we see is is pretty inherent to remote monitoring in general. So a lot of processes inside and outside the factory are still manual. Uh, so you they you know, you take manual measurements and uh, just connecting them through the internet allows you to save the, the time to go physically, and which is a process that is prone to human errors and, of course, prone to external risks. Uh, there's a really cool example about a gas manufacturing customer that had some remote pumps spread across the country, and these were subject to freezing problems uh, during very severe winter sessions. And uh, although those familiar with Nor'easter recently know what I'm talking about, and without the appropriate instrumentations in the buildings, uh, these operators depended on manual rounds to go check with the equipment, uh, container conditions, and if a freezing incident happened, it typically costed around 20k in maintenance costs, lost production time, customer satisfaction, and this problem was solved uh, very simply by adding. Uh, a few temperature transmitters that interface with their existing machines eliminated the need for all of the operator rounds that they were doing and helping avoid freezing accidents. Uh, now, and last but, but not least, uh, we got the data-driven application portion. That's the entire purpose of this webinar, and that is to enable you to create data-driven applications 
uh, not only from machine data in, inside the factory, but also by mixing it with third party resources to create even more valuable insights for you and your customers. Now, with these benefits in mind, you might be wondering where, where is that low hanging fruit? So, where can I begin? Uh, so, at Doobie Dots, we uh, categorize these four areas. Um, we have proven, we have seen it, them to prove, create a lot of value for end customers. So the most common one is production line optimization. Uh, this is because machines already have instrumentations, they already have PLCs attached to them. So it becomes a quick win to uh, lock the active, stop active times, uh, just to create, for example, an availability report or a performance report uh, by relaying this data to the cloud. The second one is maintenance in its most generic form, uh, both predictive, uh, preventive, uh, and that is all about measuring equipment variables that directly co correlate to their uptime and life cycle. Now, I know predictive and uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence are very big buzzwords right now, and that's great. We also love tech, and we've done uh, a couple of projects in that direction, uh, but in general, our advice here is um, Try to, to see if preventive maintenance is already a great fit, like, like that gas manufacturing project we just talked about. It's all preventive. Uh, and see if, if there's a lot of value there. And if, even if prediction is required, uh, try to look at the traditional statistical methods and the regression methods that have been used for decades. Uh, a great example here is uh, our industrial ovens. So, if you have a big oven and you know that by mere, mere physical principles, the temperature won't drop by a huge factor in a short amount of time, and you don't need an artificial intelligence model uh, to tell you if something is an anomaly or not. So you could do anomaly detection in that case just by doing a rolling average and then comparing their average with the actual new data, data point, and then it will help you know uh, if, if the, the temperature dropped pretty fast or not. Uh, and the third part is the energy monitoring. So there's a good amount of energy meters already installed in factories, uh, mostly uh, already you know, in the electrical network, measuring already the, device, the, the variables that we are interested in regarding, for example, con consumption. So it becomes a, a quick project to extract the, this data using a serial device and then relay this data to the cloud. And lastly, uh, we have remote monitoring in general, where, it's, where we put all of the applications doing online measurement of physical variables involved in production processes. So not exactly uptime or performance in this case, but simply raw temperature, uh, tank levels, for example, or what we're doing today, HVAC monitoring, et cetera. Now, of course, the blue ocean exists inside and outside the factory as well, and maybe it might be bigger, depending on your network, uh, to, to talk about this outside the factory as well. So here we might be looking at asset tracking, so think of a construction company that needs all of their construction assets to be monitoring in their remote sites, either for uh, asset management purposes or for maintenance purposes. Uh, think about data aggregation. So a lot of you automation clients or SIs might already have projects where you have data being relayed to the cloud, but that data belongs to a proprietary platform provider. So that's a very typical case for energy monitors that are cloud enabled. Uh, so we, we have seen SIs already formulating projects to aggregate the data that is already in different platforms in the cloud so that they could have it in a centralized dashboard that, that can uh, help decision making. And lastly, environmental monitoring, one of my personal favorites, uh, given the whole value that could be derived from a single device. Uh, we have seen SIs I doing very, very interesting projects for, uh, let's say, for example, pollution monitoring, uh, noise levels monitoring, and this, we really recommend exploring this for especially SIs that are working in major cities. 
Um, and with that, we conclude the conceptual aspects of our Data Drives Decisions webinar. Now, um, if you have any questions so far, uh, if you notice there's a Q&A box option below, or there's also a chat. So Cameron here is helping us moderate these questions so we can address them at the end. And if time doesn't allow, we will send every, every one of you an email with a detailed response. So don't worry if, if the time isn't enough. Uh, cool, so I've been talking a lot about uh, UbiDots. So real quick, uh, what, what we do at UbiDots is we made a compilation of the most common components of Internet of Things initiatives. And this is data storage, analytics, dashboards, alerts. And we baked all of this into a user-friendly interface that gives users a very simple way to deliver data-driven applications that not only they can understand uh, as integrators, but something that also end clients and automation clients and operators can also understand. We'll be looking at this in, in a bit. And to show you how simple it is, we will use all of these new tools we've been talking about today, so the Siemens device, the cloud, to create an HVAC monitoring application, uh, proving in, in the way how these tools, including UbiDots, of course, can help you save a lot of development time and project costs, while, of course, improving your business and your customers' uh, happiness in general. So, from a very top level overview, this is the diagram of what we have here today. So on the left side here, we have a temperature and humidity data logger. It's a standard microcontroller capturing these two variables and inserting them into an RS485 network. So we chose that because we know it's an industrial uh, typical protocol. And then we'll, we have the Siemens gateway, which is equipped with a very cool tool called no red. So in case you're not familiar with no red, um, I really recommend you taking a look of it. It, it. It's not only shipping in this device. It's more generic tool that can, are, is being used in web servers, uh, IoT, etc. And it really helps. We will see the interface in a while. Uh, you have a very simple way to drag and drop boxes to connect web services, online tools with hardware devices. Um, with us and, and the things we'll be talking about today. And then we'll be relaying this data to the cloud. Uh, and then we'll, we'll have, we have a complete separate device that over Wi-Fi is uh, subscribing to the temperature readings and then is deciding whether to turn the ventilation on or off based on, on the temperature. So what you see here in the red box is what we'll be covering today. The rest of the scope is documented online. We will be sharing with you by email uh, all, all, all the resources, including the code and everything you need to replicate this in your own places. Cool, so this is our, or the actual view of what we have here and as simple as industrial IoT is to say, it is equally as simple to assemble. So we have, we can see there's a, we tried to, to replicate a complete industrial environment with very rigid materials. And we even use like the serial cable for the RS485 input. And as you can see, the Siemens device, Siemens device has this nice industrial feel and it is equipped with, with a computer internally. It also has a beam rail option that you can use to, to access it. Sorry, to, to mount it in, in the industrial setting. Uh, cool, and with that, let's, let's dive into the hands-on practice. So, with the uh, first thing you need to know about the Siemens device is that uh, it's a computer. So, it, it has everything a computer has. It has operating system, it has uh, peripherals, and while it doesn't have a screen, it has uh, a way to access it remotely through an IP address. So the first thing we do is we plug it in, our local network will assign uh, an IP address to it. And just a little pro tip here, uh, we use an app called Fing. So if you ever come across the, the problem of trying to figure out the IP address of a device that doesn't have a screen uh, within a network of hundreds of devices, then this is a, a great way to do it. I really recommend it. 
And here you can see, uh, this was a screenshot of my phone. We detected the Siemens device with an IP address, and I quickly noted the, the address over here to see how it looks like. Cool, so here I, sorry, maybe appointment there, but not today. <laughs> So now, now we are inside the Node-RED. So as I said, it's a very cool tool. It is so simple, we're literally doing only three steps in this inside the Siemens device. So all it does is we take the uh, RS-485 serial input, and this, this little box here is a, like a debugger. So I'm gonna show you real quick what it does. And um, I deploy. And I flushed the, this debugger. And we can see every five seconds, that's the temperature data we're getting. Now, if I hold this sensor in my hand, uh, this, what's gonna happen is it's going to increase the humidity. So you will see every five seconds, this humidity going up. So you see it went from 40 to 51. Now, but the cloud is not going to understand that you know, raw data serial format. So, what we do in the next function is we have a uh, parsing function, we call it like that. What we did is we went from a serial output to a uh, JSON format. So JSON is a very common format for cloud APIs. So that's also what, what UbiDots uses to understand the data that's being uh, fed into the, into the cloud. And the next step is just, uh, what we call an MQTT client. So those not familiar with MQTT, uh, it, it could mean a lot of things. It's, it's a very wide protocol, but in a, in a simple form, MQTT is a protocol for communication that was designed specifically for the IoT. And it, it is very lightweight, it features encryption, and it is a, what a lot of IoT cloud support, including of course UbiDots. So that's how we're going to the cloud. So going back to the presentation, this is what we just did. So again, we take temperature humidity readings, we relay over serial me message, and then we send it to the cloud using MQTT. And with that, we're ready to see our data in the cloud. So it all starts with your devices. So here, I'm going to click in my Siemens device, and you will see I have the same three variables I was just sending data from, except that I'm not seeing them locally in a local computer, but I'm, I'm seeing them online uh, in a platform that could be accessed from anywhere in the world. So again, here I have the humidity. If I increase this over 40, you will see the change here, you know, every, every five seconds. And data, in its raw format is not enough to drive decision making. So that's why we have something called dashboards. So the dashboards is a way to see the same data in different flavors. In fact, here I just created, a, a pre-configured a very simple dashboard to explain how this works. And this is useful for integrators because they can configure one type of dashboard for uh, the operator, another type, for the manager of the production line and another type for the type for the top management, for example. So to show you how simple it was to create this, I'm going to go ahead and add a new widget. Uh, in this case, we're going to add a gauge widget and then we're going to select our Siemens device and then we'll click on the humidity and then finish. And you just saw in just four clicks, we were able to create uh, an additional widget that I can then uh, configure, place in my dashboard, and see the data in real time. Now, we see uh, not all of the cases are about looking at a dashboard. In fact, dashboards in IoT is only the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot to data analytics and visualization, uh, including reports, etc. One of the tools that are important for this journey is the event management. So events allows you to have your data work for you, even if you're not looking at a screen. And I pre-configure like three very simple events. In this case, we have one that says, if the temperature 
is below a threshold, then I turn the fan off. And it's, uh, if it's getting too warm, then I turn the ventilation on. Now, this is not only a way to control things, but also to route information through different means. For example, text messages, uh, web hooks, if you want your, if, if you as an automation client or, or your end customer of, of an SI has a system for maintenance tickets, then you can configure this logic so that using a web hook, you hit the customer uh, system and create a ticket automatically. And to show you how, how simple it was to create this, uh, here you can see the conditional events logic that we have. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to, I selected the humidity, and if it's greater than 60, then uh, I'm going to be sending a, a text message to a Google Voice account just for the purpose of being able to display the result here online. So if I click the continue, we have our event, and I'm just going to go to my Google Voice account. Uh, and if we go back to the dashboards, I increase the humidity again. Uh, we have to wait a couple of seconds for that to happen. So, oops, sorry. Need to sign back in. So now it's at 67, so we should receive a, and there you go, a, a text message. Uh, and you can see it's uh, at 62 in that case. It was triggered when it was 62. So events is not only the only way you can make your data work for you. Uh, sometimes a very helpful way is to create new data on top of existing data. So for this reason, I pulled a quick, real quick what it's called a dew point. So those who are familiar with the dew point, uh, it's a very simple uh, computation that is very, very used in, in the healthcare world, uh, also the industrial world, to measure the comfort based on the temperature Celsius and the relative humidity. So I'm going to show you how you can compute the dew point, eliminating the need to have a dew point sensor uh, in, in the factory or in an uh, IoT setting. So we, there's a model called synthetic variables as part of our analytics engine. And I'm going to insert the same formula using a simple UI. So I, I'm going to take the temperature in Celsius because that's how the formula was built. And then I'm going to subtract parentheses 100 minus relative humidity. And then I'm going to divide it by five. I'm going to click save. I'm going to call this a dew point. And we'll give it some time to compute because that's there's millions of data points behind. So it's being computed. And now we have the data in real time. So the cool thing about this is this variable becomes a whole input for dashboards, model, reporting, alerts, and everything we've seen so far. And just to give you more examples, following the lines of energy monitoring, for example, let's say you have a current sensor and you, you know that the voltage is constant. So you get the power, power times current, power equals time, uh, current times voltage. And then you get that power and make a sum over an hour and that will give you the energy. So all of this is possible using this analytics engine. And in, in this example, you just use one temporary, one current sensor to build an entire energy monitoring application. Whereas in other cases, you would have needed more, more devices increasing the cost of, of the overall solution. And lastly, you might have noticed uh, we got some outdoor data here. So this being a monitoring for temperature applications, we thought it would be cool to include outdoor data as well. So the way we did this is using a tool called movie parsers. Now, we've, we talked a lot about how the cloud enables you to do third-party cross-referencing. So you can create data not only from within the factory or from within your clients or your hardware devices, but also from external sources. 
And to show you how simple it was, we created here a snippet. It's a 50 lines of code, all designed to query a public website, which is called the Weather Underground. It's an IBM company that offers real-time weather data uh, in a public API. So we use this service to ingest all of this data every five minutes. And this is a great way for IT staff, uh, IT teams who might have, or will, would certainly have some level of Python programming or Node.js programming in this case. And instead of having to become experts in API management or cloud servers, with 50 lines of code, they're able to pull these external data sources and in, insert them in the, into a system that allows them to create more and more uh, data and visualizations for decisions. I, I, I love, there's, there's a really cool use case about this, again, about energy. And it is a customer in Australia that's uh, bringing in the live uh, kilowatt per hour price. And that ultimately helps them determine whether they should turn on solar panel systems or use the traditional energy. All of this in real time and with, with these tools you're, we're looking at today. So with this, we conclude the practical part of our webinar. Uh, we have uh, more things uh, uh, like organizations and customers. You only need one license for all of your customers. So if you are an integrator, if you have 100 customers with 1,000 devices, you can decide where to allocate these devices and, and you only have to interface with, with us. And with that, we, we conclude. Uh, so uh, we're going to give, give some time for, for the questions. Uh, again, thanks a lot for your attention and we will look forward to seeing these questions. So. Cool. Thank you, everyone. It was a great webinar. Augustine, Tony, it was great to have you guys today. We don't have too many questions. One question we have comes from Gabish, and it is, what is the IoT 2040 Siemens device, and how much might it cost, and what is it best used for? I know that this is something Augustine touched on earlier in our chat, but maybe you can just circle back and just give us a few quick pointers for Gabish. Absolutely. So in terms of cost, uh, we could be looking, they have an educational version, an industrial version, the range being from 200 to $300, more or less. Um, you ask about alternatives. So uh, personally, I like this very much because uh, it, it's, a, it's a provider that already has the channels and the support. For, so if you're an automation client, you might want, want to, to work with non-suppliers. But there's very great uh, alternatives. So we, in, we have in our website a list of, of this. We can relate this uh, over email. So there's one very, very interesting company from Germany. It's called Canvas. They did a device called the Revolution Pi. So it's a res Raspberry Pi inside, but in the external part, it's all industrial grade with uh, all the ports and everything you need. Uh, there's also uh, some other gateway suppliers. And my, my advice here is to look first, define the connectivity, uh, see if you need cellular, Wi-Fi, or if you can go with internet itself and then see if they have a Linux system inside because the Linux capability inside the gateway is what allows you to have the flexibility to configure it for a myriad of applications. Awesome. Our next question comes from Jesus, and he's asking, can any PLC connect to UbiDots? Cool. So uh, it's a very broad question. It really depends on the PLC. Uh, we have seen a lot of applications of PLC stopping to UbiDots. Uh, in most cases, they, there's an intermediate service in the middle, so an inter intermediate device. For example, you have a PLC that talks uh, OPC UA. So you would have a gateway inside the LAN of, of, of your factory. Uh, this gateway will pull data or, or would act as an OPC uh, client or server, depending on your configuration, to communicate with the PLC, get the registries that, that it needs, and then use the payload that we need to send the data to UbiDot. So the answer is yes. Uh, the long answer is you need an intermediate gateway unless the PLC has you know, a way to configure uh, IoT protocols inside it. 
which I doubt. So we'll have to look at the device. Awesome. The next question again comes from Jesus and he's curious, how feasible are, are the actual industrial applications if UbiDots has any available webinars or potentially a few tutorials available? Augustine, can you elaborate how better Jesus can navigate UbiDots? Sure. So depending on your geography, we might be able to connect you with uh, well-known SIs that are already familiar with the cloud. Uh, if you're an integrator and you're interested in becoming a partner to UbiDots and then uh, using us as a way to create new leads that for your geography, so this is also an option. So it, it's you can get in touch with us uh, either if you're an automation client or our SI, and we will look for the best to, to, to sit the, the, the required players in the table so that we your project can come to, to a successful end. Awesome. Uh, and our next question comes from Pete. What are the implications of using hardware devices in terms of FCC approval and getting connected with the GPIO? Um, okay. Okay, sure. Um, so FCC, it's, it's a good question. So the DIY world has a lot of low cost options, uh, but the, the problem there is they don't have all the certifications that you might expect in the factory level. So that, that's one great piece of advice to give, and that is when you're buying an gate, industrial gateway, make sure it has the, the proper uh, certifications. Um, and then regarding GPIO, um, I would say, depending on what you want to measure, you need to look for either digital or analog uh, support. So a lot of these computers being uh, Linux computers and being more like in the digital world, uh, they don't ship with analog ports. So if your application, if you have uh, a voltage that's variating between uh, zero and five volts or between zero and 24 volts, make sure you have the proper uh, conversion in the middle so that you can put it either in the digital domain or in an analog domain that is compatible with the GPIOs of your device. Awesome. And with that, I think we have answered most, if not all questions. I don't see any additionals popping up here. Anything that we may not have addressed, we'll be sure to connect via the email coming by to all registrants a little bit later today. Um, before we let go of everything, I'd like to thank Tony and Augustine for their time. And I'd also like to thank every one of you for joining us. If you have any questions, always know that you can reach UbiDots at support at ubidots.com, or you can reach us in the in-app chat channel in the bottom right corner of each one of your applications. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.